what I think is really important about the creative process is that it allows us to take something that we're experiencing inside, like an emotion, and move it into the physical world. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is about art therapy. We're talking about using art as a therapeutic tool for healing and self-care. We also talk about the effect of social media on our mental health and how to overcome perfectionism. Our guest today is Amelia Hutchinson. Amelia is an art therapist and psychotherapist from British Columbia, Canada. She runs an online private practice supporting adults in their mental health through creativity. Amelia runs weekly open studios on Zoom, as well as offering group and individual art therapy. Whether you think you're a good artist or not, I definitely recommend listening to this episode. I really loved it because it just reminds us that art is for everyone and how powerful art is for healing and reconnecting with ourselves. Hi, Amelia. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. How are you feeling today? Oh, great. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here. So first, why don't you tell us about your journey and what led you to become an art therapist? Yeah, sure thing. So a little bit of background. Um, My name is Amelia Hutchison. I'm an art therapist and working towards becoming a registered psychotherapist as well. And I think creativity has always been my way of making sense of the world from being a little kid trying to make sense of of grief and trauma and kind of moving into adulthood, I think there's been no better tool in my life for just making sense and processing emotions than, than art, painting specifically for me. And you know, when it came time to start to choose a path, uh, I had a mentor mention art therapy offhand once, and it was like a switch uh, flipped in my head. I remember thinking, oh my goodness, art therapy is, is a career. And I think it combines my my interest in human beings and psychology and mental health with with creativity, which is one of the most important pieces of my own life. So it felt like a natural fit. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's the first time I've ever heard of it as well. And I do. You, is there a reason why you think it's not that popular? People have never heard of it. Sure. I mean, it's a fairly new field. I think you're you're not. Uh, alone in only just having heard of art therapy. It's fairly new compared to other types of traditional therapy. And I think even in just the past couple of years, people are starting to learn a bit more about it and understand that it's not just arts and crafts or or making things to feel better. It's it's a real therapeutic discipline um, with lots of important research and and evidence backing up how, how important and effective creativity can be as a tool for taking care of ourselves. Yeah. Just so we're more clear, like, can you explain it more in detail? What is art therapy and how does it work? How does it actually help heal heal our trauma? Sure. So technically speaking, art therapy is an approach to mental health care uh, provided by someone who has a specific kind of training in art therapy. And that training is usually a master's level degree that combines psychotherapy and counseling skills and different creative arts interventions. And what an art therapist will do is instead of just having conversation with a client or with a patient, they'll bring in different types of creative mediums. So maybe it's painting one day, maybe it's collage or clay. It it really can be anything visual. And using visual tools as a way to help that person process emotions, reflect on what's going on in their life, kind of make sense of, of, yeah, what their mental health journey looks like. So you know, when things are tough to put into words, as as they often are, art therapy can be a really wonderful alternative to, to simply using conversation. Yeah. I love that idea so much. It makes sense why art is so therapeutic, just even without the therapy aspect of it. And for people who are visual people, I, I'm a visual person. Like it, it, it's nice to hear that there's like a re, you know, there's a method for communicating without words, <laughs> right? Um, so, so how can you explain, like, how does art help you feel better? How does it help you process your feelings and trauma? Mm. I mean, so many ways. Art therapy 
is similar to, to talk therapy in that it can be used to address all sorts of, of mental health concerns or just personal well-being goals. But thinking specifically about trauma or processing kind of more challenging emotions, what I think is really important about the creative process is that it allows us to take something that we're experiencing inside, like an emotion, and move it into the physical world. So we actually get to manipulate materials and do something tangible right? So maybe that is making an expression of sadness or grief or trauma and actually getting to practice a sense of agency and ability to change it, manipulate it, uh, imagine a different future for it. I see. So it can be very symbolic in a way, like, like your feelings are now like in a visual form, whether it's a painting or something. And then from there you can work through it like that. Yeah, there's, I think, two ways to think about art therapy. The symbolism is one really important way, right? Creating something that is a representation of what's going on inside you. That's a really powerful way of of moving through challenging experiences. But we also know that just the physical act of making something has uh, a calming effect on our nervous system. So sitting down to embroider or paint or knead clay will actually send a message to our bodies that it's safe, that we can enter a space where it's okay to feel regulated. So it it works in both ways. And depending on a person's goals, um, different approaches can be used. Okay. That, wow. I, I see how it can be good from a lot of different angles. So when you're in like a clinical art therapy session, are you asking questions, like how much direction and how many questions are you asking? What does it really look like? So it really depends. Uh, every single session is totally, totally different. I feel like art therapists often have to to reinvent the wheel with every client um, because every single person is very, very different and chooses different materials and has different preferences. But oftentimes the way a session will work is we'll come into a space, we'll have a check-in and we'll decide, okay, what is, what's the thing that needs to be explored or worked through with the art? And sometimes that will mean I'll give a specific prompt or an invitation to the person I'm working with. So for example, that could be something like, you know, imagine a space or like a vessel that could hold this experience of grief or trauma. What would that look like? Uh, or they might move into something totally spontaneous if they're feeling comfortable and follow their own intuition. So depending on what that person's comfort level is, there's lots of ways that they can enter into the art process. They'll have a chance to actually make something and I'll actually be making something alongside them. Mm. And then as we move towards the end of the session, we'll actually get to process, put the artwork up on the wall or in front of us and talk about what they're seeing, what the process felt like, what associations they have. Maybe there's something they want to change about that. This sounds like such a fun job, to be honest. (laughs) I think I would enjoy doing this as well because you get to make stuff and you're just like talking to someone and people kind of let their guards down while they're making art. Um, (laughs) That's funny. Um, Do do you try to finish an art piece per session or are there no rules around that? Yeah, no, you you nailed it. There's no rule. Sometimes it feels good to try and finish something, but I'm always saying to clients, you know, we we might move to a place of pausing and reflecting, but there's no pressure to to finish something or come to a place of completion. Yeah. One thing I know know a lot of people have an issue with though is like being a perfectionist with their art and what they create. And some people don't even want to create because they're like, oh, I'm gonna mess it up. Um, how do you deal with clients that are like that? Mm, well, I think, I mean, perfectionism is is in the air we breathe these days, right? We're shown so many messages and images of what we're supposed to be doing with our lives, how we're supposed to be performing. And it's it's rare for a lot of people to have a space in their lives where they don't have to do something perfectly or finish something or do it to a certain standard that could be sold or or posted online, right? So you're actually, you're describing something that happens in in so, so many art therapy sessions. But the way I think art can hold that is hopefully we can create a circumstance in the session where it's okay to make something messy. It's okay to make something imperfect. And I might give some specific prompts around ways to do that, to make it feel a little bit safer to to practice doing something that isn't to the standard that the other things in our lives have to be. So what is the main shift that you notice in people once they start practicing art therapy? Like, is it, how is it different from traditional therapy? Like, I I don't know, what, what are the key changes that you see in people? I think I consistently notice 
a sense of trusting your own intuition. Like when I work with folks for for a longer period of time, I often notice the shift between maybe they want a lot of very specific instruction at the very beginning. They want to be told, okay, what's the project to do for this? How should I work on this? And over time, as people get more comfortable working with different art materials, um, making things without knowing how it's going to turn out, you know, doing spontaneous art in that way. I think over time, when someone participates in art therapy, they come to have this sense of, okay, I know how to identify the feeling I'm experiencing right now. I know what material I probably want to, to use to start to work this out. And I know how to begin, not necessarily knowing what I'm going to make or how it's going to turn out. But I think... Yeah, the most significant shift I see oftentimes when I work long-term with people is that they just trust their ability to to hold big emotions and they have this mm-hmm. new tool to, yeah. to do that for themselves. Yeah, I love that so much because I see like the metaphor in that because the way people live life, right, is they want to be told what to do. They want, want to follow instructions and they're too scared to like figure it out on their own. But when you give them art, like the like as an artist, right, the more you create art, the more you're in tune with your intuition and your inner voice. And you're just like, mm, let's try this. Let's try this. And then you stop judging yourself so hard. So mm-hmm. I think there, there are so mm-hmm. many lessons in just doing art that can apply to living your life in a more, I don't know, more peaceful way or more fluid way. Um, I, I don't know if you know the tagline for Lavender is life is an art, make it your masterpiece. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so I love the metaphor of art as life and, and, and going about life as like, however, you know, you are the creator and you get to decide what you want to create. And a lot of people in the beginning of that stage are too scared to, 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 you know, be creative and to figure things out. But yeah, what you're doing with people is like helping them tap into that side that has that creativity and that power. So I, I, it's exciting for me to hear that. But exactly. And, you know, there's good reasons that people feel anxious or even unworthy of, of creating things, right? So many of us grew up being told that we have to make art in a very specific way or that maybe we didn't even have opportunities to make art, right? So much of the way art is taught or the way kids are encouraged or not encouraged is to make things that, you know, follow specific rules, have a specific probably Eurocentric standard of beauty. Um, Art is only seen as valuable if it's marketable or accurate, right? There's lots of messaging we receive as young people about what creativity should be so I think, you know, my my mission as an art therapist is to help adults unlearn some of that programming and come back to creativity as a safe and accessible way of challenging some of those those beliefs and those internalized internalized systems. Yeah, I love that so much. Um, do you have any favorite art prompts that you can share? Are these things that our listeners can try to do themselves at home or what is your take on that? Yeah, so I think a couple of ways about that. I think I think creativity is for everyone. I don't think art therapists need to to gatekeep the creative process, right? There's so many ways that creating can be therapeutic. And I think one of my favorite prompts is not so much a specific instruction, but an invitation to give yourself a space. Maybe that's a journal, maybe that's you know, a roll of craft paper up on the wall where you have permission to just make marks and express without the goal of it needing to be something specific, right? And that's that's tough. So much of, of our lives, there's this pressure to, to document things or to, to show it on social media or, or make it into something productive for work. So I think the biggest invitation I could offer is to just gift yourself a space where it's just for you, there's no goal of achieving something, perfecting something, and you're allowed to just experiment with materials and how it feels to actually use things like that. Yeah, I love that prompt so much. Cause and you said something that I want to talk about is like not like don't think about having to post it on social media. Um, I think a lot of people. This relates to life too, not just art, but. As a content creator, my mind is now wired like, oh, everything I create has to be liked by people. It has to be this or that. And in one way, you can call it like business minded, but on the other end, it's, it's like debilitating for your the artist inside. And a lot of people, they 
you know, when they live their lives, they do it for the photos. They do it for, oh, does Mm -hmm. this look good? Let me like prove to my friends that I'm having fun. (sighs) So yeah, I, I can see how you're like that prompt to just like start to do things just for yourself, like create things just for yourself can really like turn that on its head. Like what, what is your take on, you know, creating for social media? Cause you are on social media as well. Hmm. I'm so glad you asked this question. Um, yeah, the way social media impacts our mental health is, I think, one of the topics I'm most passionate about. Also, just because I am a content creator and I am a person who's visible online. And I really notice the impact that has on my art practice. And I think when I'm working with folks who have that question of, will I post this? Won't I post this? I simply, I guess, invite them to think, okay, what's changing about your creative process when there's that voice in your head or when you're imagining the audience seeing this? You know, I think there can be a really big difference for people when they're creating and they know nobody else is going to see it versus creating and knowing that it's something that is going to be put out there. And neither is wrong. I want to be really clear about that. I think social media is one of the most brilliant tools we have for sharing ideas and inspiration and building community. And the other side of it is that for a lot of us, I think it takes yeah, it takes moments in our lives that otherwise could be just for us and makes this pressure to to perform and to perhaps do what we think we should be doing or make in a way that we think we should be versus what actually feels good. How do I like to hold a paintbrush? What marks feel good to my body? Yeah. Uh, I want to go deeper into that topic because I understand that there's like, you know, knowing the difference between am I doing this for other people or what does it feel if I'm doing it for myself? But what are the ways that you, you know, make that conscious decision or how do you, do you set a boundary? How does that work? (laughs) Maybe your therapist side can come in because I I need help (laughs) with this. And you know what? I need help with it too. It's something I bring to my own therapist. Um, Yeah. Like for example, when I went on vacation recently and, you know, I went on vacation this time not to create content just for myself, but my brain is just wired like, oh, this would be a great video. This is a great photo angle. And I, I, I don't know. It's just your brain gets so wired in that way. So how do you detach and, and really just live for yourself? I'm just, I'm basking in that question because it's one that I really live with too. I think it it comes down to a conversation of of what happens when our work and like our financial stability is tied into our lifestyle. And when we've tied together um, a showing of lifestyle and a talking about lifestyle with the actual things we spend our days doing, it, it can be hard to figure out, okay, what is my work and what isn't my work? Um, I know I definitely experienced that in, in my own life. So I think, what has been helpful is is having some boundaries for myself around okay this is a this is an art practice that's just for me um this is something i'm going to do not to talk about a group or a workshop or an offering i have going on even if it relates but having a little bit of a safeguard around some practices or some creative processes um has been really helpful in my own life Yeah. Yeah. Just like keeping something Mm -hmm. just for yourself, like Mm -hmm. setting that intention, I think is important at the beginning. Let's also talk about, I mean, you said you're also, you're so interested in this topic of social media and mental health. What is another area of this topic that you want to get into that you think people are struggling with and you want to share with others? I mean, I think social media now encompasses so much of our lives, right? I kind of laugh at the expression IRL because it used to mean just being online. And I feel like now like my online life is real and it includes most facets of the way I interact and interface with the world. So I think the places where I really see people's mental health impacted as it relates to social media is perfectionism, right? We talked about that a little bit before, this pressure to be constantly competing and producing and performing, but also this pressure to be constantly available, constantly responding, constantly documenting, right? I think the lines like we've been talking about between what our work is and what our personal lives are is pretty blurry. Um, and that's, I think that's a mental health issue. Yeah. Um, and and how do you, like in your therapy sessions, if someone's, you know, having that issue, like 
kind of setting that boundary between real life and social media, how do you work with them on that? Are there any prompts well, we I can think, take home <laughs> and journal yeah, about and think about? Yeah. I think a helpful place to start is just to really compassionately reflect with yourself, okay, what need is being met by by being online? Um, and it's not a bad one, right? I'm really, I'm really passionate about kind of taking taking down these assumptions we might have about social media being bad and being online being bad. I don't think that's true, but I think there is a space for us to get really curious about like, what are the emotional needs that I'm reaching for when I'm online, whether that's scrolling or whether that is posting, you know, whether we're creating or, or consuming content. So, you know, perhaps a place of curiosity is to scroll for, for 15 minutes and notice like, okay, what, what was I hoping to feel in that experience? How did it actually feel? You know, perhaps that's, we're hoping for rest. We're hoping for a moment to, to detach after a really exhausting day. Those are really real and valid needs, right? We need those things. Um, and then there can be a place of, of deeper inquiry of, okay, so social media might be one way I get this need met. What are the other ways that I could build into my emotional tool belt mm. to, to get this met if social media isn't always feeling like, like my favorite coping tool? Yeah. I like that. The, the distinguishing, like what were you looking for? And then how did it actually feel? Because I think many people open social media looking for feelings of like connection, entertainment, or, or all these things. And then they end up like, you know, I'm not sure if it's every, every time, but you know, you, sometimes you end up with a lot of negative things like, oh, you start comparing yourself and you start um, or your brain just, sometimes my brain just feels like a mush scrolling for too long. And then I'm like, what did I just do? Um, because those apps are trained to keep you addicted. And so I think that's the, that's a mental health problem too, is like, how do we build mental strength and, and that self-discipline in a way to know when to shut it off? Cause I think a lot of mm. people just do it mindlessly and they're addicted. So how would you work with someone who, who has that issue? Mm. I mean, I have an issue myself, right? I think mm -hmm. I'm yeah, so glad I think you everybody mentioned. Everybody does. It's because it's literally why, like, it's the dopamine hit, right? Like, you see something new every totally. time you scroll. So, how do we break that? Because ultimately, we want to take back our time and our our energy, right? The first most important piece, and this is something you said, is shifting the blame. I see a lot of of conversations online about oh, I just need to do a digital detox or I need to have a different routine or ritual. Like there's a lot of personal responsibility taken for a systemic problem, right? Mm -hmm. Behind every, every phone is thousands and thousands of software engineers, behavior analysts, like the, the intention of, of the attention economy is to keep us on our screens. So I think when I'm working with folks who are exploring this issue, the first thing is to give ourselves a break, right? It's it's convenient for, for those systems to say, yeah, it's a matter of discipline. You need to quit or find a way not to use these things so much. But you know, when we talk about addiction, you know, we're talking about something that impairs our ability to choose. So mm -hmm. I think the first thing, like I've said, is getting really kind to ourselves and gentle. Yeah, like, yeah this is hard. It's it's designed to be hard and yeah. you're not weak, you're not faulty, you're not unintelligent if if it's challenging to put your phone down. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, so starting with compassion, kindness to yourself, because everybody's dealing with it, <laughs> literally. It's time to take a break for today's sponsor, Babbel. I sometimes wish I had paid a little more attention in Spanish class at school so that I could actually use it in the real world. If you're like me and there's a foreign language that you regret not learning, it's never too late to start with Babbel. Babbel is a language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions. With Babbel's addictively fun and easy bite-sized language lessons, you can finally cross learning that new language off your list. I used Babbel to brush up on my Italian when I traveled to Italy. I even did lessons on the plane and at the airport during downtime. It was really fun and helpful for my trip to get my mind comfortable with the basics of the language again. In addition to lessons, Babbel offers learning through games, podcasts, videos, stories, and live classes. 
classes. Plus, it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. Right now, get up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash T-L-L. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash T-L-L for up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. I mean, I want to ask a follow-up because I, is there any other, so what's the next step beyond the kindness to yourself? Like in, in kind of like working on letting go of some sort of addiction, whether it's to social media or something else. I think taking the attitude of a researcher at first, kind of gathering, okay, how is this making me feel? And bringing that mindful awareness into how we experience it, right? So we're going to try really hard not to judge ourselves for the fact that it's hard. But then I think what can be really helpful if we're noticing a habit that isn't serving us or it's not a coping tool we want to keep reaching for, maybe starting to document how it felt after spending an hour or three hours or six hours scrolling, right? Mm -hmm. And just starting to drop in, what was that like for my body? What parts of that did I like, right? We don't need to say the whole experience is bad, but also what parts of it didn't I like? And when it comes to the actual good and the usefulness of social media, I think also building out what other what other places in my life do I find those things? If it's inspiration, then what are the offline or in-person spaces where I find that? If it's community, right. what are the offline or in-person spaces? Not that we always have to choose the offline space, but starting to build a web of, of resources so that when we have this need for connection or validation or rest or whatever it is, there's a menu of options that, yep, yeah, it could include time online. It could also include a weekly dinner party with friends. It could include three pages of journaling. Um, so yeah, really building out that that emotional tool belt. And, yeah. and that's where I think art becomes a really powerful tool for people when we spend time online is it's really tactile, right? Mm-hmm. Instead of being with, with a screen where everything's pretty 2D, you actually get the experience and your body gets the experience of engaging with something physically. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's definitely something that we miss and we don't recognize, we don't realize that we miss like physically working in the real world, doing something with their hands. Cause I'm literally on the computer and my phone all day <laughs> working. Me too. And so it's, yeah, like I haven't picked up a paintbrush in a while. Um, so I think just reminding people to do that. And I think uh, like, I, I like, let me reiterate the point of like, recognizing that there are other options to get the the feeling or the emotion that you were looking for. It's you don't have to always just turn to one method which was your phone. Okay. Um so my next question is just self-care through art or the online space. So how can we take better care of ourselves through art? And there's so many ways. There's so many ways. <laughs> Broadly speaking, I think what creative practices give us is a chance to actually just check in with ourselves, check in with with what's true, right? We spend so much time consuming the things other people create and kind of flipping the script and getting to author something for ourselves is is a way of of taking care of ourselves. And I also want to be really clear that creativity doesn't need to be a six foot painting and brushes and it doesn't need to include expensive materials or any kind of skill, maybe your creative practice is making a playlist. Maybe it's how you organize your stationary drawer. Maybe it's the ways you parent. Like there's so many things that we do on a daily basis that take innovation and creativity. And I think turning towards those as creative acts is, yeah, a way to to acknowledge our humanity in them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because human beings are meant to create. Whether you think you're creative or not, like we all create. (laughs) It's something that we can't help. Like we have to do it. And I like that you mentioned like even organizing a stationary drawer is creativity. For some people, an Excel spreadsheet can be creativity, like organizing it and making it, right? And so I I like that you open up the definition that it can really be anything (laughs) that you make it. So yeah, so thanks for sharing that. Um, going back into art therapy, I, I'm curious, are there any misconceptions about art therapy that you want to, you know, talk about or bust? Yeah, definitely. I think 
sometimes art therapy uh, is misunderstood as being like just arts and crafts or as being kind of fluffy, right? I think because it's a, a newer field, it's been around for a few decades, but there's less awareness of the kinds of training that art therapists have and yeah, the real evidence behind why it's so effective. Yeah. Um, okay. And so, I mean, from your teachings and everything that you learned in your experience, maybe you can, can you share with us how it is definitely effective? <laughs> like just kind of, kind of like bust the skeptics. Cause I mean, I, I, I'm a person of intuition. So if I hear something, I'm like, oh, that sounds like that works. Like my intuition knows, but some people need like hard facts and, and logic and things like that. So how do you explain why art is healing? Ooh. Okay, cool. Yeah. I like, I like yeah. taking it from that perspective as well. Mm-hmm. And I think, and most intuitive people like, yeah, art, creativity. Yeah. That makes, like I'm that like, that it makes, makes total sense. sense. Right. But the people that don't believe in it, that think it's woo woo or mm-hmm. too fluffy are the people that need hard facts. So let's give it to them if you have any. Okay. So, so one way that we could explore this is thinking about like what the nervous system needs, right? The nervous system is the part of our body that tells us when we're in danger, when we're in fight or flight, or when it's safe to, to relax. And what we know about, about memory specifically is that it lives in the visual side of the brain. So when it comes to processing traumatic memories, sometimes conversation alone isn't all that effective. It can be. There's lots of ways to process trauma, but some people find that it's challenging to address like the physical symptoms of trauma, right? The body being on on very high alert. Just doing that with conversation alone. So the things that can be really effective, and this is known as kind of a bottom-up approach, is addressing the body first. So that could mean different kinds of somatic practices, movement, um, yoga, exercise, but it can also mean working with the visual. So making images about something is a way of beginning to process a memory or perhaps a traumatic experience that not necessarily is with, with words, first of all. I mean, conversation and verbal exploration comes with it, but I find sometimes... Sometimes when a person's in talk therapy, they'll be describing an experience, but they're kind of conscious of what they're describing, right? You kind of know what you're saying as you're saying it. Mm -hmm. Whereas what often happens in an art therapy session is someone will start creating, they'll stand back and they'll say, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that I'd use that color or that shape. And that reminds me Mm. of this thing or this thing. Like there's a capacity for our unconscious to to communicate with us through visual media and bring things forward that perhaps verbally are harder to access, if that makes sense. Oh my gosh, that does make sense. So you're saying conversation comes from our conscious mind. So it's like everything we're aware of, but obviously with trauma, there's a lot of stuff we buried down that we either, you know, either consciously or unconsciously buried down. And so through art, it can, it can come out and surprise you in a way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's kind of two two ways to think about about processing trauma. Top down, which refers to moving through like a cognitive type of therapy, discussing and making sense, kind of checking in about you know, whether or not something's true, whether or not something is actually threatening to us. That's one way. But trauma also, as we know, lives in the body, right? I mm-hmm. might know that I'm not in danger or that you know, there isn't a bear walking towards me, but my body doesn't know that because of whatever past experience or whatever past trauma. So the other way to approach, approach healing is bottom up. And that's again, where visual types of processes or somatic and body-based processes can be really effective in reassuring and soothing the nervous system. Oh, so you're saying what, yeah, if you're working from bottom up with the body first, you're trying, your goal is to like calm down the body so that the person can open up a little bit more about yeah. it, and, and work mm-hmm. through whatever it is they need to work through. Okay. That makes right, sense. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I do f- like, I've done talk therapy and sometimes it is like, if you're an introvert, sometimes it's hard to open up or sometimes, sometimes it's just hard to explain things with words. You're like this experience totally. is so detail how do I even begin to explain to you and I, like you feel like what you s- explain is only like a facet of the real story right as a therapist like I'm sure 
nobody can ever explain to you ev- like you know cuz cuz they lived it and there's no way you can know everything about it so how do you make sure you receive the right information for you to be able to help them if that makes sense do you know what i mean cuz sometimes people don't sh- share cuz they don't know oh the therapist needs to know this piece of information and there's yeah even as a cl- like a what am i called a client <laughs> yeah even as that like it's you don't even know what to share because there's so much. Oh gosh, that's a really, that's a really interesting question. And I think for me, it comes back to trying to disrupt power hierarchies in, in therapeutic relationships. Um, I'm not the expert of a client's experience. I don't actually know what the right questions are. Um, and I think what I really try and build into my practice is a sense of curiosity and trust in the person I'm working with. So there aren't necessarily like right leading questions to ask about someone's art. Uh, I'll often start with, well, so, so what do you see? What do you notice about this piece? And wherever they intuitively take it is, is the correct direction. I might see something that I think is a sunset or a tree, but I'm, I'm never going to say that out loud. Actually, I'm never going to offer my own interpretation. Exactly. Exactly. I see. So you're just trying to get them opening up from their perspective as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We might talk about, you know, how it felt to hold a crayon, like the physical sensation of that for an entire session and never actually talk about what the art looks like. It, it totally depends on what about the experience stood out for them. And that's, that's what will follow. And I mean, there's, there's infinite ways to explore a piece of art. And I think yeah we're never going to get the full picture, right? A picture is worth a thousand words and, you know, probably millions. So I think trusting that the right content and the right, um, the right conversation will happen if, yeah, we open up a space together where, where the person can explore what's feeling relevant to them. My loves, let's take a break to hear about today's sponsor, Fenty Skin. Skin that looks healthy, bright, and smooth all starts here with the Fenty Skin Starters. It's your daily pore busting regimen made up of three easy steps that step up your tone, texture, and brightness. Step one, get clear. Unclog your pores and remove dirt, oil, and makeup without stripping with the Purifying Total Cleanser. Step two, deep treat. Power down on pores, dark spots, and shine with their Fat Water Toner Serum. Step three, lock and shield. Lock in hydration, reduce the look of pores, target discoloration, and prep skin for makeup with the lightweight Hydrovisor Invisible SPF 30 Moisturizer. It's high-performance skincare for all skin types designed for you, me, and we. Get the Fenty Skin Starters now at FentySkin.com. And best of all, Fenty Skin is giving our listeners an exclusive promo code to try out the starters. Head to FentySkin.com and use the code LAVENDER20 for 20% off a starters bundle, OG or fragrance free. Wow. It sounds like there's, you need a lot of openness for, for that person to be able to open up. And, and, and it's, it's almost like you, you have to trust that whatever they share with you is the right thing. <laughs> like you're meant to talk about that. Is, is that how you go about it? You just trust whatever they share? Yeah. And that's, that could also be called a person-centered approach. I think, yeah, it's, it's really important to trust that my client or group member or, or whoever I'm, I'm working with is absolutely the expert of their own experience. I might come with a skill set and a knowledge base, but at the end of the day, they're the person who created the art. They're the person who's living inside their mind, their body, their spirit. And it's important for me as a person walking alongside them to trust that, that they can hold themselves and tend to themselves. Yeah. Um, okay. So moving on, I, what is anti-hustle art studio and why did you create it? Mm. (laughs) So this, this ties back into what we were talking about before. Um, anti-hustle art studio is a weekly space on zoom, uh, to drop in by donation, open art studio where folks can gather for an hour on Wednesday mornings to create. And I started it because I realized that I wasn't actually making art that I didn't post on social media. And I just personally really needed a space where I made things and expressed without it being a part of my work. So it felt really important personally and selfishly, but also I think I'm hearing from lots of people that there are fewer and fewer spaces in their lives where they just get to express and have a creative experience. Mm -hmm. So 
again, it's it's a weekly open studio where there'll always be a theme, a couple of art prompts, but the space is open to practice both creative self-care and creative community care. Yeah. I love that idea so much. I think it's amazing you started it. Um, how, how many people are in your weekly studio sessions? Yeah, it, it depends. It ebbs and flows. Sometimes it's like 10, sometimes it's like 30. Uh, it's drop-in. So sometimes people will come every day for a month. There's people that have been coming every every Wednesday since the beginning. And sometimes people see a theme posted online and say, oh, actually, yeah, boundary sounds really important. I'd like to explore that. And we'll come to a single session. Oh, so so does everybody work with the same theme? Like, how does it work? Do they Is it same medium or anything like that? Yeah, so it's different every single week. Uh, I really try to give art prompts that could be explored through through any material, even even non art materials, just to make it accessible to folks who maybe don't have an art studio or art material set up. But every single week, there is a different theme. So some examples have been uh, setting boundaries. This past week was surrender and letting go. Uh, we've talked lots about perfectionism, hustle culture, all these kinds of things that that are mm-hmm. coming up a lot right now. And there'll be three options for art making. So maybe one is to explore materials in a new way. I'll give a couple of ideas, but every week it's totally open. So people might start with one of the prompts and then make something completely different. People might show up because they've been working on a quilt project they've been meaning to make time for. So it's pretty open uh, for people to use however they like. That's awesome. And do you share your work like in that session in any way? Or is it just like a space where people are like heads down and creating? Like how interactive is it? It's a little bit of both. So at the end of every session, there's a chance for everyone to hold up their art. Uh, There's not a lot of talking. People don't unmute themselves. It's not a space where we do a lot of processing. uh, And that's on purpose, just so people really have an hour to go into their own personal, personal process. But the best part of every session is in the last five minutes, people will start to hop into the chat and share a little bit about what they made or how it surprised them. We'll hold up the artwork. So it's kind of like this great mosaic of, of different art from people from all over That's the world. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And then we all choose one word. So it ends with a collaborative poem. Everyone will think of, okay, what is it that I'd like to take away from this experience over the past hour? Or what would I like to give to the other folks in this space? Mm. And so we all drop one word into the chat and then create this, yeah, collaborative poem together yeah. and end by reading that. Wow. I just think that's such a beautiful idea. I wish, I mean, I'm going to, I want to check it out. And I wish these, I I wish resources like this were more available to people. I think most people don't even know this kind of thing exists, right? Um, But I think it's awesome. And I, it sounds, already hearing it, like it sounds so fun and so healing. Okay. um, My next question for you is how do you suggest people stop judging their art or their creations. We kind of talked about this earlier, perfectionism, but I think it's a it's a big question that so many people deal with. It's huge. I think it's the biggest barrier that I see most people coming into art therapy with is a desire to create things, feeling like a creative being, but getting stuck at the, oh, this is bad. Oh, I can't draw. Oh, I draw like a five-year-old. Like I, I probably hear that once a week. <laughs> but I think <laughs> yep. when it comes to challenging that voice, it can be really helpful to pause and just ask yourself, okay, who, whose voice is this, right? We learn beliefs somewhere and we're not born with the belief that we're bad artists or that we're bad at drawing or painting or whatever it is. So doing a little bit of getting curious about, did I learn this from you know the art classes I took as a kid? Did I learn this from a parent who had a specific idea about what art should look like? Is this just part of the culture? And getting curious about like where where is this voice coming from? And I think once we kind of identify that the voice actually isn't ours, we can decide like okay, I'm going to set aside the voice of capitalism or or you know my mean third grade art teacher and start to engage in a new way. Yeah. Yeah, it's true because what like that belief must have come from somewhere and it's so prevalent. So many people think they're not good enough at art and so they don't do it. And it it's there's no like do you believe there's no good or bad art? It it's just it just is an expression. <laughs> yeah, so that yeah, means anyone yeah, absolutely. can create. Yeah, anyone can create anything and there should be no judgment. And then the other side of the spectrum is obviously we know that some art is is more marketable and more sell yeah, like 
some art people will buy and some art people won't buy. So, so how do you kind of like connect those two ideas of like art is anything versus what is good and bad art like in a museum? <laughs> totally. Yeah. I think I'm glad you used the word marketable there. I think, I think it comes down to also asking yourself, like, okay, what, what do I want out of my creative process? Is it to make something that I share and support myself with? Is it to express an idea in a certain way? Or is it just to have an experience for myself of being in connection, expressing something? Um, I think that that can be kind of helpful if we shift the goal of, of why we're making art to begin with. Yeah. Uh, I'm also curious, like, do you have, like, what is your self-care routine, like with and without art? Like, can you walk us through the kind of things you do on whether it's a daily or weekly basis to take care of yourself? Yeah, sure. So I think for me, self-care includes community care. I think wellness encapsulates not just the ways that we take care of ourselves and our own bodies, but the way that we are in community, the way that we engage politically, socially. I think it's it's a big umbrella term. So I mm-hmm. think something I'm working really hard to, to challenge in myself is making sure that my care practices go beyond the self. And I think right now that includes making sure I'm, I'm seeing people in person. I'm making plans with other people, um, making an effort to be in nature, putting my feet on the ground, um, walking my dog, I think is a really practical one, but also I think a pretty good measure of, of how I'm doing if I'm getting out into the physical world I live in. Yeah. So, but practically uh, a couple of things that have been really important to me are morning pages. Uh, that comes from Julia mm-hmm. Cameron's The Artist's Way. You're nodding. Yeah, I, I you love know that one as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do so that morning as well. pages are, are wonderful. Oh, awesome. So for anyone who's not familiar with that practice, it's simply opening up a journal first thing in the morning when you wake up. And I'm, I'm not actually good at doing it first thing. We can do them imperfectly, but just giving yourself three pages of stream of consciousness writing uh, and anything and everything. It doesn't have to be good. It probably isn't good. Sometimes it's the to-do list or just, I don't know what to write. I don't know what to write uh, over and over again. But having just that kind of brain dump space early in the morning, I find is really helpful for me uh, creatively. And then let's see what else has been important. Consistency is not my strong point. So (laughs) I'm also a person with ADHD. Yeah. Uh, And, and so self-care looks different all the time coming back to that theme of like being really gentle. So sometimes I'm in a good, a good routine of morning pages. Sometimes it's a good routine of stretching and moving. Sometimes I'm painting in the mornings, but like we talked about before, I think having, yeah, a kind of a menu of self-care items and community care items that are your go-tos are, are some of the ways that I begin to do that. Yeah. That yeah. was a little scattered. Does that kind of no, answer that's your question? Okay. I, I feel like I'm a similar way. Like I, I, I'm never incredibly consistent with any habit. And I, I also do have a menu for myself. <laughs> I have it written down on my phone. These are the things I could do, like go out into nature, take a shower, meditate, whatever. And and usually I just do what I feel like I need <laughs> for that day or that week. And But sometimes I do get so scattered that I, you know, I fall into that I, I'm a mess stage of life. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to get back <laughs> meditating and journaling every morning, which is what I'm doing now. So sometimes, you know, I do fall too far off track because I don't have that consistency, but like I can always t- bring myself back because I know the things that work for me. The structures, like that feels like a really important piece. And, and that's important for me as well, right? It's not necessarily about perfectly executing a 5 a.m. morning routine as much as, okay, I know that I have this kind of orbit or perhaps I have cycles and sometimes I'm not doing those practices. But I find it really helpful to, like you say, have have the list in your phone. I'm a big Notion user. Mm-hmm. Um, my entire life is organized in Notion <laughs> and yeah. building structures of staying organized. And you know, I know on Monday mornings, I'm going to pay my credit card. Like that's real self-care as well. Like that deals with a real, a real source of anxiety in my life. So those practical things and having systems, not that they have to be adhered to perfectly, but having those systems in place, I think is a really powerful way of caring for ourselves. Yeah, I agree. It's like knowing the very important things that like help you feel good for if it's journaling, it's journaling, whatever, but doing your best to set up that system. So it's like seamless, right? Like you, you wake up, it's part of your habit and you just do it. 
Okay. Um, okay. So last question is, how do you recommend listeners get started with art therapy after this podcast? Because I'm sure a lot of people are curious. I mean, there's so many ways. If someone is interested in pursuing a therapeutic relationship and working one-on-one with, with an art therapist, uh, you can find directories of, of practitioners on both the American and the Canadian Art Therapy Association websites. And that would be if you're looking for yeah one-on-one therapy to, to dive in to supporting you in your mental health. But there's also, there's so many ways to, to bring creativity as a therapeutic force into your life. And I think one of my favorite things to kind of quote unquote prescribe to folks is take yourself to a dollar store and imagine you're there with your inner child or take yourself through the aisles and yeah, pick something that feels exciting to work with and even take it home and begin to experiment. Again, maybe not posting it, maybe setting the intention of just keeping it to yourself, but creating spaces in your life where yeah, it's possible to reclaim that sense of play. Mm-hmm. And if it feels hard to do that alone, you could join you know, an online or in-person art therapy group. You could come to an open studio like, like Anti-Hustle Art Studio, like we talked about. But building in yeah, opportunities and situations where you have a chance of meeting yourself creatively and, and using those tools. Yeah, I love that. That's such a fun idea. It's, it's literally just create an art project for yourself without judging anything. (laughs) Um, How often do you recommend people do create the sort of space for themselves, like a space to create just for themselves? I know you do your studio weekly, but is that how often you recommend? Or I don't know, what, what is your take on that? I guess it really depends on the person and, and how many creative outlets they have. Some people really need to sit down and do their morning pages every morning. Some people really need to make sure they're yeah, engaging creatively on a daily basis. For some folks, weekly, monthly could feel fine. I think, yeah, it really comes down to to where you're feeling the need in your life. I know for me, yeah. I, I need something creative pretty much daily. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. And do you believe every human being needs a creative outlet? Yes, I think human beings are inherently creative creatures. And like we said, creativity can mean so many things, right? There are beautiful creative Excel spreadsheets out there in the world. And I think it's less about needing to add a creative act to your to-do list and finding the places in your life where you do express creativity, where you are innovative and and curious. Wow, yeah. Okay, I, I like that it's a shift in thinking. It's, you don't have to go out and start a new hobby or create an art. Like you don't have to, you know, pick a, a traditional art me- a medium. It, you just find what you're already doing <laughs> that you already find fun, that you already find that you're being a little creative, like cooking, for example, or organizing your notion. <laughs> so like find something you're already doing that you, that is fun and make that your creative mm-hmm. outlet. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. And okay. I think I'm really conscious of not wanting to add to people's to-do lists. A lot of, oh, yeah, of wellness definitely. rhetoric is like, oh, you need to do this thing and this thing and this thing. It's true. I feel that's overwhelmed why I have by a all menu. the things I'm supposed to do. I have a menu because there's too many yeah. things to do. I can't possibly do everything in like a day or a week. Okay. that's I really like that advice because then I, I want to look at my own life and find, okay, what are the real creative outlets that are just for fun and not for work? So I'm going to, that's going to be my project my homework after this podcast. Um, Are there any last words that that you want to share with our listeners? Any tips, just things like that? I think just the permission and the reassurance that you are a creative person, you know, whether or not that's been, been true or been believed throughout your life. I think all of us have the capacity and and the ability to connect to ourselves creatively. Um, That can look so many ways. And yeah, it's a wonderful and generous thing to give yourself space to express and explore and, and meet yourself in that way. So I'm hoping, yeah, I'm hoping folks that are listening are feeling jazzed and inspired to, yeah, to do something creative. Yeah, I'm sure they are. All right, Amelia, la- lastly, where can we find you online? Sure. I'm on TikTok and Instagram. My handle there is Art Therapy IRL. 
which stands for In Real Life. My website is Art Therapy In Real Life. And anyone is open to join Anti Hustle Art Studio. Again, that's by donation every Wednesday. I also run different kinds of therapeutic art groups. Those are our longer term groups, like six weeks long, with a chance to go deeper into topics like uh, creating your own Oracle deck or exploring social media. So yeah, if you want to stay tuned on some of those offerings, you can find those on my website. Amazing. Everybody, make sure you check out Amelia Hutchinson. I'll link everything that she does in the show notes down below so you can check her out. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really enjoyed our conversation and thank you for the work that you do. Mm, yeah, thank you so much. It means a lot to be able to, to share and explore it in this way. Yeah. And I, I just hope more people learn about art therapy because I can see how it can change a lot of people's lives. It just, it already sounds so fun and so much more approachable than traditional therapy. So yeah, I'd love to like spread the word. <laughs> hmm. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I'm glad about that mission too. <laughs> <laughs> 